Thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation to participate in the conference today and in particular to participate in this panel. I think it's a fantastic initiative and I've really enjoyed the day and I'm looking forward to the day, day tomorrow. And I apologize that I'm last very late uh, in the afternoon. Everyone's exhausted. Um, and, uh, but I, I hope we'll try not to take too long. So we're meant to talk about methods and what I'd like to do is I'd like to make a pitch for the increasing use of quantitative spatial models to think about cities and to think about the spatial distribution of economic activity in general. And I'd, I'd like to make a pitch that these models have made a lot of progress over the last five years uh, and that they connect very well with alternative, more reduced form approaches such as differences and differences uh, regressions and that they actually yield a number of insights uh, for kind of a, a more reduced form approach. And in terms of kind of policymakers who are maybe not interested in the details of these models, I think that uh, this is still of interest because these models actually highlight the kind of data one would need to make predictions about, say, what will be the effect of building a new road, building a subway line, uh, attracting a million dollar plant. What kind of data would one need in an economic model to try to answer that question? And actually the data one needs is, is relatively straightforward and the model is going to kind of uh, suggest exactly what one would need to observe. And uh, given those data, um, one can predict in quite a rich level of spatial detail what the effect of such an intervention would be. So I want to say something about methods in general, and then I'm going to try to illustrate it with some recent research, which is based on a joint paper with Esteban Rossi Hansberg and uh, Ferdinando Monte. So if we think about uh, the program today, and if we think about research on cities or the spatial distribution of economic activity in general, we're typically interested in what is the effect of some change to the local environment and how well that would affect the individual city in which this intervention occurs and then what will the effect of that be on other regions. So Marcel's point about substitutes versus complements and then potentially what will be the effect on the economy as a whole. Okay, and so what are these interventions? Well, we may be interested in studying transport infrastructure as in Matt's paper earlier. We may be interested in looking at regulations on land use. Uh, policies such as place-based policies to attract particular uh, economic activities to locations. And in each case, we want to study what is the effect of that local intervention on the distribution of economic activity. Well, obviously, the impact of these local interventions is going to depend critically on their ability to attract factors of production, in particular on the ability of employment uh, to respond to those interventions. Um, and there's kind of a large uh, reduced form literature um, in the kind of literature on local labor markets, which has tried to answer that question. And typically, it does so through some form of differences and differences regression. So what is the idea here? Well, the idea is we have some sort of intervention, which is indicated by this I here. So this might be building a road. It might be introducing a place-based policy, a change in taxation, some other kind of treatment on a particular location. And I'm interested in how does that treatment affect some economic outcome, such as Y on the left-hand side. And... Um, you know, I've called it a treatment, uh, but this intervention is not always random, so we may want to control for various other things that could affect our outcome. So they're going to be our X variables. Uh, so there'll be a whole sequence of things that we think could influence the impact of this treatment. Okay, and why is it a difference in difference? Well, typically I'm going to look at two sets of differences. The first difference is going to be before and after the intervention. So I'm looking at the change in the outcome. So the change in employment before and after uh, my place-based policy, for example. And then that's the first difference over time. And then the second difference is going to be between the treated locations, the ones that get the treatment, and some other control locations that don't get the treatment. And so that's why it's going to be a difference in difference. So when one sort of typically estimates a specification like this in the reduced form literature, obviously you know, many authors discuss the sort of potential concerns when estimating such a specification and often go a long way towards addressing those concerns. So what are the kind of concerns we, we face if we want to know what is the impact of this local policy? Well, obviously, um, any policy I study, it's really hard to ultimately find its effect because it's often very hard to find exogenous sources of variation. So a lot of the progress made in this literature has been seeking creative sources of exogenous variation to try and get the causal effects of these policies. So in other words, is the treatment exogenous or is it instead endogenous to some economic outcome? Another kind of challenge is obviously if I want to be able to measure what was the effect of the shock, I have to be able to quantify how big that shock is in order to kind of get some sense as to whether this is big or small relative to the size of the shock. And then more generally, another challenge that this literature faces and is very hard to address within a reduced form context is sort of general equilibrium effects. Because this is a difference in difference, I'm comparing a treatment group to a control group. So any general equilibrium effect of the policy, which affects both the treatment and control group, 
is going to be differenced out when I do my relative comparison to the control group. And then more generally, another sort of challenge in this literature is that when I look at the effect of these policies, whether they're at the city block level, they're at the county level, or they're for other spatial units, typically these units are linked together to one another in goods and factor markets. And it's kind of hard to control for those spatial linkages uh, to look at the effect of the policy. And so, you know, in principle, that might suggest that the effects of these policies could be quite heterogeneous. There's a heterogeneous treatment effect in terms of the, the language of this reduced form literature. So what I want to try to do uh, in making this sort of pitch is I want to try to argue that quantitative uh, spatial equilibrium models actually have uh, the ability to sort of shed light on the extent to which uh, these concerns might indeed be a concern and suggest ways in which we could amend these reduced form specifications to try to control for these spatial linkages through goods and factor markets. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, set out um, a quantitative spatial model that is going to allow locations to be connected through goods trade. It's also going to allow them to be connected through factor markets. In particular, there's going to be migration across locations. And then crucially, there's also going to be commuting between these locations. I'm going to argue that this is a reasonable model to think about the effects of these policy interventions. Why? Because I'm going to show that it matches two striking features of data that arguably any sensible model of the economy would have to be consistent with. And those striking features, uh, the first is gravity in goods trade. So gravity is just the idea that two locations trade more with one another when they're closer together and when they're both large. I'm going to show you that's a very strong feature of the data. And then also uh, gravity in commuting flows. Uh, that the number of people that commute between a pair of locations is increasing the closer those locations are and is also increasing in some uh, measure of the mass, the size of those locations. And then we're also going to set our model up so it's actually going to be able to be rationalize uh, the observed distribution of employment, residence, and income across all locations in an initial equilibrium. So it's going to be able to rationalize that outcome that we see in the data as an equilibrium of the model. And we're going to be able to use that property to try to predict the effect of these uh, policy interventions. So we're going to show that even if you have exogenous assignments of the treatment, so if, even if I consider an exogenous intervention, uh, this model is going to predict substantial heterogeneity in the elasticity, the response of local employment to that exogenous intervention. Um, this is going to underscore the importance of general equilibrium effects and the ways in which locations are linked together to one another. And then crucially, the model is actually going to give a prediction for the form of this heterogeneity, and it's going to suggest variables that one can actually compute in the data and include in these reduced form regressions to try to control for those heterogeneous treatment effects. So but just to try to convince you that linkages across locations are important, um, I think we're probably all convinced that goods trade between locations is important. Maybe it's more controversial to think about commuting between locations being important in the data. And so this is just some evidence based on U.S. data that commuting between locations is indeed important. So there's going to be evidence from U.S. counties, of which there are just over 3,000 in the, uh, the U.S., and then also for commuting zones, which are aggregations of counties designed to form uh, local labor market areas. So what these first two rows do, they report measures of how important uh, commuting is uh, for different percentiles of the county distribution. So this P50 here is for the median. And this first row says what fraction of residents work outside the county where they live. And so you see for the median U.S. county, around a sixth of its residents work outside the county where they live. But then the other thing you see from this table is that that fraction is extremely heterogeneous. If you go up to the 90th percentile, you see around 40% of the residents work outside the county where they live. So one might think, well, can't one sort of control for those linkages by forming commuting zones, which are you know, precisely designed to be local labor market areas? And so what these final two rows do is they sort of show to what extent commuting zones help. So in particular, uh, what this median column shows is it shows for the median county of the fraction of people uh, that work outside the county where they live, what fraction of them also work outside the commuting zone where they live? And you see that around one-third of these commuters also work outside the commuting zone where they live. So, of course, while commuting zones help, you have to draw the boundary somewhere. Any boundary you draw is going to be imperfect, and so they're not going to completely capture the richness of these linkages between locations. So I don't have too much time to talk about the model, so um, I'm going to try to do that very briefly and then try to highlight some of the potential advantages to uh, quantitative uh, spatial general equilibrium models. Where does the model kind of fit inside the existing literature? Well, it's going to build closely on the uh, economic geography literature, following in particular uh, Tony's work with Fujita and Krugman uh, and Fujita, Krugman, Venables, 1999. 
And then it's also going to build on a literature on uh, commuting inside cities. In a way, one way of thinking about this, what this model is going to try to do is it's going to try to bring together a literature on systems of cities, which thinks about cities trading with one another, with a literature that looks inside individual cities and looks at commuting in people inside those cities. And so we want to try to have a model where we have these cities connected as a system, but then there's also commuting between locations inside cities. <coughs> so I'm going to try to do the model in two slides. Um, in a way, its structure is kind of very simple. Um, on the goods trade side, it's going to be a standard new economic geography model, and that model is going to have this a very clean prediction uh, that we should see a gravity equation for bilateral trade flows. So what does this equation show? It shows the share of location N's expenditure on goods produced in location I. So it's the trade share, the share of my spending in N that I spend on goods produced in I. What does the model say that depends on? Well, it depends upon how many people work in location I, because that determines how many varieties are produced there. It also depends upon wages and productivity in location I, because that determines the cost of the varieties produced there. And then also, crucially, it depends upon bilateral trade costs, DNI, how costly it is to ship goods from I to N. And so this is where the gravity equation prediction becomes, as you increase distance, you increase trade costs, uh, the amount of trade is going to decline proportionately. But the amount of trade between N and I doesn't just depend upon bilateral trade costs, it depends upon what's called multilateral resistance. My trade costs to all other possible sources of supply, K. Uh, and that's summarized here in this denominator. Summing across all other locations, my trade costs to those locations. So it's going to be one key feature of the goods trade side of the model, gravity and goods trade. <coughs> and given that property, uh, a sort of useful feature of that is I can write the cost of consuming tradable goods in location N just as a function of its own wage and productivity, the number of people who choose to live there, because that determines the locally produced varieties. And then also, in terms of location N's trade share with itself, how much of its uh, expenditure it spends on goods that it produces itself. And if I have a, a low domestic trade share, that tends to mean a low uh, price index, uh, because it means I'm open to other locations, I have very good access, market access to other locations, and so I have a low cost of getting consumption goods for those locations. So that's the good side, uh, trade, of, trade side of the model. Uh, the commuting side of the model is also going to be very simple, and it's going to be related to some of the papers we've uh, seen earlier today. Individuals are going to choose where to live. I'm choosing whether to live in N and uh, work in I. And what's going to determine my choice? Well, it's going to depend upon the wage I can get by working in I, and it's going to depend upon the cost of living in N. What's the cost of living in N? It's the cost of getting tradable consumption goods, P, and then it's also the cost of land, the price of immobile factors in N. And individuals are choosing pairs of residence and workplace locations. And there's going to be a commuting cost of getting from where I live, N, to where I want to work, I. And then individuals are also going to have an idiosyncratic draw, little b, which is the only thing here that depends upon the individual omega. So the idea here is individuals get an idiosyncratic shock, which determines how attractive it is for them to uh, live in N and work in I. All the idiosyncratic reasons why people t choose to live and work in particular parts of cities. I'm going to assume that that idiosyncratic shock is drawn from a fresh air distribution. Why? Because it's going to give me a very tractable expression for commuting flows, which is also going to obey a gravity equation. In particular... I'm going to get a nice expression for the probability that an individual chooses to live in N and work in I. And what does the model say that depends on? Well, it depends upon how attractive is it to work in I, the wage, how attractive is it to live in N, the cost of consumption goods and the, and the cost of land, and the bilateral commuting costs of getting between N and I, and then also a bilateral amenity for how attractive that commute is, relative to all other possible commutes. Again, it obeys gravity because as I increase distance or as I increase commuting costs, the number of commuters is going to fall uh, proportionately. And then in equilibrium, there's going to be a free mobility condition. Everyone is going to choose the best pair for them, the best pair of residence and workplace choices. They're just going to pick their max, the place that offers them the maximum utility. But in equilibrium, it's going to turn out that a model predicts that expected utility has to be the same across all bilateral pairs. Why does that happen? Well, imagine uh, a commute is really attractive and a lot of people want to commute on that route. That's going to attract people with very low realizations of the idiosyncratic draw, and it's going to attract so many people that the average is actually going to be the same across all bilateral pairs. That's a sort of strong property of the fresh air. 
And then that's essentially the model. Um, one advantage of this framework, it looks like pretty complicated because I've got locations connected in goods markets. I've also got them connected in factor markets. But actually, it, it remains amenable to an analytic characterization. You can actually show that as long as the agglomeration forces in this model are not too strong, uh, there exists a unique equilibrium. And in fact, that equilibrium has some kind of inversion properties, where if I see certain things in the data, I can recover the implied value of productivity and the implied value of amenities in every possible location in the economy. The uniqueness of the equilibrium is also important because if I want to understand the effect of a place-based policy or some other local intervention, it means I can use the models to do counterfactuals and the model is going to have a determinate predictions for what the effects of those policies are. And the one sort of final advantage uh, of this specification is, um, as in the recent quantitative trade literature, I can do these counterfactuals in a way where I use the observed bilateral trade shares in the initial equilibrium and the observed bilateral commuting shares in that initial equilibrium to generate predictions for the effects of the policies. So why is that an advantage? Well, if I wanted to model everything that determines bilateral trade costs between locations, that would be a very challenging endeavor. If I wanted to model the, all the details of the transport network that affect the bilateral costs of commuting between locations, that's also really, really difficult. But what I can do inside this model is I can use the observed shares in the initial equilibrium to capture those unobservables. And I can use that, starting from that initial equilibrium, I can use that to do the counterfactuals. I think I've got about five minutes left. Is that right, Tony? Three well, Six or seven. Six or seven. Okay. I'm looking at the counter down in okay. the bottom corner there. No, it's good. <laughs> it needs, needs to tick on a bit. Good. So um, now I want to show how we can take the model to the data. As I mentioned, kind of for policymakers, what would be the key bits of data you'd need to implement this? Basically, you need bilateral goods trade between locations and bilateral commuting flows between locations. Given those two bits of information, uh, you, can, you can go a long way in terms of using this framework to predict what would be the effect of a local policy intervention. I'm now going to illustrate that with US, using U.S. data. So we're going to use the Commodity Flow Survey to get bilateral trade between locations, and we're going to use the American Commuting Survey to get bilateral commuting flows between locations. I'm going to set the sort of parameters of the model to match a couple of central values uh, estimated in the existing empirical literature. And this is sort of why I was sort of arguing that I think gravity and goods trade is a sort of central feature of the data that, that any sensible model is going to have to be consistent with. This is just showing you a bilateral goods trade between uh, CFS regions in the U.S. after taking out an export of fixed effect and an import of fixed effect. And I'm just showing you now the conditional correlation between trade flows and distance. As distance goes up, trade flows go down, and you can see there's a very tight fit uh, to this relationship with an elasticity of about minus 1.29. Here's the same relationship for commuting flows, less widely studied, but again, you see that uh, gravity uh, has a lot of predictive power for commuting flows. Again, this is after taking out a source fixed effect and a destination fixed effect, and I'm just showing you the partial correlation between commuting flows and distance. Very tight fit, arguably even tighter than for trade flows. The elasticity is also a lot higher. The elasticity is just above minus four here. So shipping people around is much more costly than shipping packages around, So presumably because there's an opportunity cost of people's time. There's at least one reason for that. Okay, so two very strong features of the, of the data that the model's kind of built uh, to match. <clears throat> so what I want to do now is try to use the model to look at the effect of an intervention, a particular place-based policy, and to show the ways in which it could enrich and uh, be informative for reduced form differences and differences type approaches. Um, I'm just going to do one example today. We do other things in the paper. I'm going to shock every county in the U.S. with a 5% productivity shock. Using these shares in initial equilibrium, I'm going to solve for the general equilibrium impact of that for every single county. So I've got 3,000 of those experiments. And then I'm going to compare that to what I would find if I ran a reduced form differences and differences regression using those data. What is going to be the punchline? Well, we're going to find that these local shocks have extremely heterogeneous effects because they depend on how counties are connected together in the initial equilibrium. And the model is actually going to propose a very simple sufficient statistic that captures those connections between counties in the initial equilibrium. So here is the result of that exercise. So this is a kernel density across the 3,000 counties in the U.S., each one individually being shocked one at a time with a 5% productivity shock. If I were to estimate a kind of mean, uh, the mean is around 1.4 here. So this is the elasticity of local employment with respect to a productivity shock. It's bigger than one, in particular because of the home market effects in these models and the agglomeration forces in, inside of the model. But what you also see is it's extremely heterogeneous. It ranges from close to zero to more than three. So if I was to take that mean of 
And I was to tell a policymaker in an individual county what would be the effect of attracting a million dollar plant or a place based policy, if I just use the mean, that can actually be potentially quite misleading in terms of external validity. Because although the mean is 1.4, it could be close to zero or it could be uh, more than three. Okay, so a lot of heterogeneity inside of the model. This so is just to show you that that heterogeneity is really driven by commuting here. On the, on the same graph, I've shown you the elasticity of residence with respect to the same productivity shock. And you can see that the support of that is much tighter. So the reason this elasticity is so heterogeneous is indeed commuting. And the model suggests a simple sufficient statistic for that. When do I have a very high elasticity? Well, when the locations around me supply a large share of my employment, but I attract a very small share of their residents. Because then there are many people in these locations who would actually be quite willing to commute to me in the sense that they like me, uh, they don't dislike me, uh, and you know, the fresh air distribution is very skewed. If I attract a lot of residents from another location, it's only the people who really hate working in my location that are left there. Okay. So the model gives a sort of very simple sufficient statistic. So if you put that sufficient statistic into a difference in differences regression, so you regress the change in employment on the treatment indicator, and then the, the treatment indicator interacted with the sufficient statistic from the, from the model, you can go a long way towards explaining this heterogeneous treatment effect. If you use more standard controls like size, employment, wages, area, those perform pretty poorly, uh, but using these commuting linkages performs pretty well. We use various different control groups in doing the diff and diff. One of the things that's sort of interesting is that often analyses use the closest location as a control, mo motivated by regression discontinuity designs. I want the unobservables to be as similar as possible. But of course, the closest county is also the one which is most affected by linkages in goods and factor markets. And so actually, uh, you see here, the diff and diff regression doesn't quite get the actual treatment. That's because of the GE effects. And the gap is particularly big if I use the neighbor because it's most affected by these spatial linkages. So I'm pretty much out of time. Uh, what did I try to do? I tried to argue that the sort of quantitative spatial general equilibrium models can be insightful for thinking about the effects of interventions in cities and for economic activity more generally. Uh, these models predict very rich linkages between locations in goods and factor markets, and that those are actually crucial to understanding what is the effect of a productivity shock, constructing transport infrastructure, or some other interventions. And that the model actually suggests kind of measures that I could compute based in the data I see. In particular, if I see initial commuting patterns, the model suggests a measure I can, I can compute from those initial patterns, and that I could include in the difference in differences regression to increase uh, its predictive power. Thank you. Excellent. Good. Okay, we've got 20 minutes for questions. I'm going to abuse my position as chair and do the first one. So, Steve, I have a, a very crude version of that model in my head, uh -huh. right, that I've repeatedly tried to apply to the following question. What would happen if we built a high-speed link, rail link, between London and Manchester? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if it's just market access, then probably Manchester gains. I mean, it's a U-shaped relationship. If it's market access plus urban urbanization economies <laughs> could go either way. If it's that plus commuting, it could all end up in London. Mm -hmm. But then I think, well, but the real <laughs> thing is I need sectoral heterogeneity, right? Yeah, some <laughs> sectors will go to Manchester, others will go to London. It's whether they're complements or substitutes, exactly mm -hmm. Marcel's point. So, you know, I, the, the, that crude version of the model get in, in my head gets me so far, but then, damn, it doesn't get me to the last mm -hmm. step. Which, which I think is actually the really important one. Anyway, um, yeah, that's a really I great. That in. Yeah, that's um, a really great comment. Really interesting one. Yeah, the way we wrote down the model, uh, just to kind of illustrate things and keep things as clear and sharp as possible, we just uh, wrote down a single sector version of the model. Yeah. But for example, doing a multi-sector version with Cobb Douglas preferences or something like that, it's actually I mean, it's pretty it, tractable. It, um, it could be done, but then you've got to know whether they're localization economies or urban. That, 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 that's the difficult bit. Mm -hmm. What sort of intersectoral agglomeration stuff is. Right. Uh, no idea how you... Yeah, so here that's yeah. all home market effects. So it's all the elasticity of substitution. That's okay. But it's um, any so the crucial thing would be knowing how that varies across sectors. Yeah. Things that real yeah. You can, it's actually interesting. In the paper we kind of show there's a set of isomorphisms between this model and an eaton Cortum style trade model, but with external economies of scale. But there... It's a single sector model, so the external economies are just total employment. You could imagine a multi sector version, then you'd have to take a stand is it your own sector employment or other sector employment that matters? Yeah. In principle, you, you can do all of that if you 
you yeah, parameterizing it's called bubbles. Back to, yeah, you need to know the those parameters. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's a challenge. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we still have 20 minutes for questions since I wasn't seeing the clock properly. Uh, okay. Well, not, 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 I mean, questions and comments. Do, do the panelists, does everyone want to come and sit up here? Let's rearrange the furniture. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, I think this is addressed to the to the second presentation. I believe that was um, Marcel. Is it Marcel Marcel five five chums? Yeah. Yes. Uh, on um, uh, your presentation on building cities in the countryside. Now, um, well, I agree with you. Um, it's an interesting presentation showing the pattern of growth in city, of cities in Africa, and I agree on the need to, uh, to know how to plan and manage the growth. But um, one thing about these small cities is that uh, you cannot run away from them urbanizing. And um, for, from, from, from what I, I heard from you, it's, uh, it's like we're trying to suggest <coughs> that um, we need to protect those small cities from urbanizing. Um, well, well, okay, let me just finish off my, my, my point. So, um, but, but I, what I, I, I would have loved to hear from you, because urbanization is, in, is inevitable, and we're becoming more urban even with your projections that you, the projections that you've shown for Africa. But what I, sh what I would have loved to hear is um, how to place functional importance on cities, like, uh, uh, you know, f planning for cities at the national level, by placing functional importance on certain cities, depending, uh, uh, relating it to their economic potential, so that um, as we are planning for, for these cities, the cities that are, are seem to have certain potential are, kept, are, are developed in line with that potential, and others that have the potential, for instance, for agriculture, are kept as, as agricultural cities. Because the thing is that I think it requires, of course, a lot of research and preparation of national planning frameworks and national urban policies. But uh, I would have loved to hear more of the, 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 the placing of functional importance on these cities, because urbanization is taking place. But I think what we need to do is to place functional importance on cities and see what is, what is the uh, projected uh, economic potential for, for a particular city and um, reserving it for that particular economic um, um, potential that it, that it possesses rather than just protecting the hinterland because um, like you talked about mining cities, of course, like in, in Zambia right now, one of our cities that has really had the largest population growth, was, it used to be a, a rural city. But now because of the, the, the discovery of minerals 10 years ago, it's, it's the fastest growing city in, in Zambia. And um, agricultural land, land, of course, has been lost there. But there are other areas where we know that, okay, this, if, if research is, proper research is done by planners, you would know what the value of probably the, the underground, uh, I mean, the, the, the value of the land is and the value of the, the in terms of the potential of that that's, that city possesses, and then you'd be able to reserve it for that particular potential and, you know, according to their functional importance. Okay, let's... Um, see if there are other sort of questions and comments on, on, on this theme, right? You've got yeah, half a billion more people to be accommodated uh, in Africa. So what can research tell us about yeah, mega cities? Do we want cities of 30 million? Uh, if not, what secondary cities should grow? I mean, I go around asserting satellite cities are a good idea on the basis of zero empirical information, zero evidence. Uh, so other sort of questions, comments on that? Yeah. New cities, accommodating half a billion people. Um, you. And then well, I'd like I'll to turn to the panel to yeah. respond ourselves. I'd like to speak in support of what was just uh, said with some information. This is a, as much a comment as a question about the situation in Tanzania. Um, I've looked over about 50 years, and uh, at the beginning, shortly after independence, Apart from Dar es Salaam and a number of regional capitals, there were no towns more than 10,000. Now, uh, Dar es Salaam is 4.5 million. The regional capitals are, are not as big as that, but they're quite sizable. But in addition, we have one, about 120 towns of more than 10,000. And these have, uh, some of them have clearly grown at transport nodes. Um, some of them I can't find on the map of Tanzania published last year. And so uh, there's a very interesting question. I mean, 
The strategic question is, uh, should the authorities be simply reacting to the growth that has taken place for whatever reason and wherever it is, or should they have some strategy, as was being suggested in the Zambian case, for identifying where the most promising areas are and guiding in some way, certainly by uh, preemptive investment, for example, how, 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 how the growth uh, should take place. And one more point. Um, when this is discussed as a workshop in, in DAR in February, the officials from regional and local government were talking about the problems they, they have in handling this uh, entry into the urban hierarchy of settlements that were previously villages or non-existent or whatever. And the first problem they encounter is uh, reclassification of land from rural to urban, and that raises a lot of problems, as people in China also found, I believe. Uh, secondly, um, the legal procedures for admitting a, a settlement to a new status involve a lot of consultation locally, reference up to the central government with amendments being come down for reasons which are unclear, and it takes an awful lot of time. But finally, and this seems to me almost the killer, and it reflects something Tony's put in his brief for this thing, these new councils are not resourced to do the things they're supposed to do, and there's a very, very big problem about how to resource the authorities set up to manage these settlements to do the things they're meant to do. Okay, any other yeah, comments or questions on this same theme? Yeah, could I, could I respond or have a go at responding? So I'm, I'm trying uh, to. Get, or do you want to keep going with questions? And yeah, well, any other questions or comments on this? You know, where, where uh, new cities, the non, the very non-marginal changes. Let's get a bit of. Bit of, so if people can be fairly brief because the hands are popping out. Yeah. <coughs> uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, mine is just uh, a comment, not really a question. As you model the possibility of these cities growing and people moving from rural areas to urban areas, I, I think there is also another effect that is coming these days in Africa where more affluent populations seem to move away from urban centers to a little bit far. So I think your model, your Models should reflect uh, a certain optimum point where a certain population starts moving out and the poor move to the city, the urban centers. Mm -hmm. So it actually comes together and then again decolors. And I, I think, I don't know how you can factor that in in your model. And if we can get good evidence that it <laughs> really is a phenomenon. I think there was one right behind, yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to bring the case of Rwanda. Uh, one question in general, uh, not cynical, but whether uh, these models we just uh, listened to in this panel presentations uh, would be able to help uh, in, a, let's say, short foreseeable time of the policy makers at, at the uh, countries. Like in Rwanda, bas uh, basically there is Kigali, the capital, and there are about six cities, but uh, reasonable size and, and, and urbanization, all the rest. So the government is facing with the fact that, uh, okay, how to support, uh, whether just to follow the events or to try to uh, drive uh, something. But in order to drive wisely, you need some reasonable uh, data or thing. Uh, the matter of fact, what I've seen, what happened, the government want to be neutral politically, and in fact, uh, they providing almost the same amount of of transfers to the 31 districts, uh, irrespective of urban or rural or, or something, um, in irrespective of the size, uh, except uh, Kigali, because Kigali is a, is a different animal. But so the, the real question is that uh, how to translate this kind of things into this very challenging uh, policy thing. And when we brought in the World Bank a new project, try to see uh, support the six secondary cities, some other donors came, come on, there is no organization, but we'd like to support. You need to support Kigali and forget the rest, uh, just against uh, this kind of analysis. So, and even the policy dialogue is difficult because of, there are some powerful donors saying that, come on, no, no, don't, don't do that. Anyhow, we are powerful yeah. mentally too. <laughs> Any else from the audience, from the floor, on this sort of theme? <laughs> we can come back to it. Marvin Marcel wants to... Um, okay, so just a couple of words. Um, I know the first um, question. Uh, about the first question from the lady from yeah. Zambia, I, I didn't imply that uh, we had to kill agriculture or something like that. So it was really um, trying to summarize some of these um, theoretical predictions about how activities 
agricultural activities and urban activities would self-organize across space in equilibrium. That, that was basically trying to uh, summarize how these uh, uh, models predict the organization of activity across space. And so uh, the history of the hinterland is if you have a town, that's how agriculture or organizes around it. Um, but that doesn't answer the question of how you would want to how, how to prioritize, how do you identify uh, areas with high potential. The, I, I guess the, the thing, so, you know, I'm sure Steve will have, uh, 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 Nate will want to add to this, but, um, it's, you know, it's a certain issue that's been resolved. In a sense, I, I'm asking for more work on that. Um, but what the, 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 what the, the, the little bit of theory that I presented they do make predictions. They do make predictions about the zip, you know, the, 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 the zip flow just says you're going to have some really big cities and you're going to have a whole series of cities. So you cannot just say it's Kigali only and I ignore the rest. You, you know, that's not, the, a normal economy will have a distribution of cities and small towns and all the way to eventually, you know, the, 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 the farmers. Um, and so that, that's something that should be expected. Secondly, not all cities, not all six cities can be the same size. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. And the reason why that's not going to happen is because the, the goods that cities produce have a different reach. And, and, and if the agglomeration effect within a sector or within a couple of sectors, and these sectors have a very large reach, and they, they will naturally they will want to concentrate in one place. You can try to force them in, to be in several places, but then it's not, it's, a, it's not efficient. You're going to have to subsidize that. It's going to cost you a lot of money instead of letting... Uh, these active, like financial sectors, they really like to be in one, 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 you know, like six places in the world or something like that. So that's the sense. In, that's a sense of uh, that's uh, as far as the model can uh, go in terms of uh, prediction. And some of it is about these uh, these static certitude effects. So you 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 know, if you have a, a big center here, you cannot have another really big center right next to it. You can have some satellite small cities. So, so you know, it, it, it makes predictions about organization of space, although. One other thing that I, I noted in, in, in Steve's model, uh, because I think you anchor the kappas and the B, you get uh, a unique equilibrium. But actually, a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, Crystal or any SART model, they don't have a unique equilibrium. They have a lot of other possible uh, equilibrium configuration. So, to some extent, it's reassuring because it means it doesn't matter. Okay, so at some level it doesn't matter, but I, I, I still. Well, they might be well fed ranked. I mean, that's yes, all equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. No, that's true, and and, uh, and they certainly can be influenced by uh, infrastructural development. I'm sure of that, and and um, there must be you're right. the ranking yeah. Yeah. of these uh, these choices. Yeah. So, so, uh, Steve, I mean, uh, um, we'll come so I think the questions are really interesting. Uh, as an economist, I just don't know enough to ah. Rwanda and Zambia to make a definitive answer. And I would actually go be even stronger than that, and I think. If you took every economist in this room and you told us everything you know about Rwanda and Zambia individually, we'd all come up with a different recommendation for which city to, to grow. Because if we just have a coffee table conversation, we don't know how to rank all the different dimensions. Of, there are all these trade-offs. So where, where should we go? Actually, I would argue that we've, in the research profession, we've gone a long way. There are now a number of frameworks around. Uh, and in particular, Garrett and Melanie's paper this morning, I think, is an example of this, and also a recent paper by C.A. Moretti, where we actually have sort of pretty standard frameworks now for kind of doing accounting decompositions into wages in the data. So I see what I see for these cities is I see wages and I see land prices. And if I want one city to grow more than another, it must be the case that I think people are more productive there and somehow there's some constraint to that city growing, there's some market failure, there's some friction, there's some barrier. Uh, the paper that Melanie and, and Garrett presented today has a way of quantifying those frictions, and so does the CA Moretti. So I would actually argue that what something like the IGC should do is it should take a number of these kind of canonical frameworks, which are sent, which are, um, CA Moretti is like a growth accounting framework, but done in space, and it should just do that for Zambia, it should do it for Rwanda, and then we should look at the city which has the biggest wedge. And if, you know, all these models are abstractions, none of them's correct, but if I do a number of different approaches and they all tell me Dar es Salaam is way smaller than it should be, well, then the policy advice would be, let's grow Dar es Salaam. And, uh, and I think that would actually be a huge step forward because we kind of get away from, otherwise it's so subjective. Like I can, my preference is I put more weight on one thing you tell me, 
somebody else puts more weight on another. But at least if we have a number of these standard accounting decompositions, we can do them and we can look in the data and see which, what explains the size of Dar es Salaam. Is it very high productivity with a big barrier to migration? Well, then we should grow it. And so actually, I think we've made a lot of progress. But it's not something that I could answer today, or I don't think anybody here could give a definitive answer. But I think increasingly we have the technology almost like a diagnostics, like a kind of growth diagnostic. So we could run a sequence of diagnostics on the data. If they all tell us different things, well, then we might want to be skeptical. But if we run a bunch of these diagnostics and they all point in the same direction, that could be exactly something where economists could help uh, policymakers giving sensible advice. So um, and I think it's a great question, and I'm sorry I don't know more to actually be able to talk about Rwanda and Zambia. I just don't know enough about those countries individually. Um, I, I guess, yeah, so it seems like the, the relevant policy question here is like where you build the, if you have a certain amount of infrastructure you're going to build, you know, do you put it in the, in the capital or do you try to develop these provincial cities? And, you know, I think we do have some empirical evidence that can be brought to bear, maybe from other countries, et cetera, to, to, to try to, see, to to evaluate those sorts of proposals. But um, I mean, you know, it, it comes out there's going to be heterogeneous treatment effects, and you, you want to have a theoretical framework, like Steve mentioned, to, to help you think about this, I think. Okay, we've only got a couple of minutes, but yeah, quick, quick round of other comments. Yeah, can I, can I wish well, right, that? Because actually, I have. I have fairly strong opinions, and uh, <laughs> I think what, I think what the question is actually badly posed. Uh, it's unclear to me why the government actually wants to impose we should have cities like this on an open system like that. What's the big market failure here? We don't even know that empirically. What we know is that the, well, the record of governmental intervention on those things is absolutely awful. I mean, so do we want to have like more Brazilians? I don't think it makes any sense. So, also, I'm slightly, I understand with all the issues about building infrastructure and all of that, but we know that those places can actually get developed after when people have moved in. So, there's, there's one thing called demand, and we should listen well to demand and not be entirely well supply led, and those supply well decisions will be made by, by people who know nothing, including us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more arrogant about what we know. No, I mean, I. Yeah, I, I don't think the, the point is whether the, the ult, or ultimately whether the point is whether a government should decide whether to promote a city or not, or larger or smaller. But there is one fact that all cities need government and all cities have public goods. And, and so yeah. for, for a new city to appear, uh, maybe it's not the discussion whether the a government decide to put it there or not, but what fiscal rule should exist for that to be possible once there is demand for localization of firms, right? Because if, for example, you are in a country where a new, a new technology appeared to produce, for example, soybean in the north of the country, and it's very productive, but all resources are centralized in the national government, and there's no water, there's no sewage, no, no, no professional want to move there at any price, then it's not going to develop. So, so I think it's more the rules for this to happen that it's important to discuss that the decision of water to subsidize one area or, or another. And maybe moving to another uh, presentation, I thought that by l I'm not working a lot in this area, but by looking at all the papers today, I'm surprised that the f you don't conclude that the first need we uh, we have in data is regional prices. And there's a lot of wages and population, but there's always no prices. So when I, when someone showed me relative wages increase or the difference, well, fine, but what happened to prices? Because if I don't know that, I, it's hard to interpret. Okay, any other burning comments? Klaus, and then I promise we'd finish after an hour and a half. So Klaus, then... So, uh, so I think an, another, in, I mean, in, in the line of what Steve said, I, I think it's very interesting to... Uh, uh, do comparative studies across uh, different countries. So let me just give one example. If you look at uh, productivity differences across uh, cities in the U.S., uh, those differences are much smaller than across cities in China. And so you could, for example, make the argument as development progresses, most likely 
these productivity differences across Chinese cities will uh, become smaller over time. And that will, of course, you know, in, in any kind of model of a system of cities, that will have predictions about which places are going to be growing faster, which places are going to be growing slower. And, you know, that's an example where this type of comparative stat study can give policymakers some insights about, you know, where where might the growth be happening and it would be in some sense demand driven but you know you may want to uh, take those things into account when you plan ahead uh, for uh, infrastructure or for other types of decisions because the self organizing economy which which Marcel was talking about maybe that's what we should do not intervene at all but the reality is that policymakers want answers to these questions and to the extent that they want answers to these questions, you know, we as researchers must, must try to, uh, you know, g give, uh, give at least some kind of sensible answers. Okay, does anyone on the panel want 20 seconds? <laughs> Not loading the question? No, no, some clarity. Steve? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think Gilles' point is really good about the market failures. That, and that's exactly where I think that these growth diagnostics can try to help. Where are the, where's the misallocation or where's the, mis where's the market failure? We need to understand that much better. Um, so I agree very much with that comment. Well, a quick comment. Um, we might not be, I, I, I wouldn't like uh, people to think that I was adv advocating some kind of uh, very complicated uh, planning, but rather what I was saying, something like um, it doesn't make sense perhaps, for the Chinese to try to build at the same time 100 cities of the same size. Because that's not, that's not what the model spread it, that's not what Zip flow spread it. Okay. Uh, I, I guess uh, Sebastian's comment. I appreciate that. That we need better estimates of costs in cities. We have we have more. We know more about productivity than about costs, and they're both important. Okay. Um, let's thank the panel, but also let's get Helen. Helen, can you? I don't know where or what or when dinner is. So there's important things. Anyway, let's thank the panel. <laughs>